Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael Wright from ARJ Construction, and today we're just going to give you a, a, an insight talk through the industry and uh, potential routes through to um, employment and a uh, career in the construction industry. I'm um, joined today by my colleague, Sam Carroll. Uh, I'll allow her to introduce herself. Hello, everybody. So as Michael said, I'm Sam Carroll. I've worked alongside ARJ for the last nine years and I've covered all of our recruitment, predominantly Rob White collar roles within the, our team. And the last year I've been looking after the HR side of things as well. OK, so I'll move on into uh, I'll give you an overview of uh, what it is we'll be. Uh, what we'll be doing once my. There we go. So uh, ARJ have been around for more than 30 years um, and um, and we're a Stevenage based company, but we mainly do work within London, but also we have sites in in Manchester and and uh, uh, out into the uh, home counties as well. And our um, works, we, we construct new buildings and we also refurbish old ones. Um, and those new buildings that we construct, they may be apartment blocks, um, could be offices, educational establishments, retail units or hospitals, uh, and that includes the refurbishments as well. Um, we work in places such as Selfridges, um, as well as hospitals um, and, uh, and many schools. And some of our uh, current um, and past projects, we're working with Booking.com, um, and obviously a lot of you will be familiar with that if you're, you're uh, booking holidays, um, um, uh, accommodation, hotels and what have you. They're, they're, that's a, a, a development in Manchester. So that's a refurbishment of um, an existing building and an extension um, onto the side with a new building. Um, Metro Bank is, a, is another scheme, which is a refurbishment of an old building into, into repurposed for new. Quite often what's happening these days in construction is that there'll be buildings that were once offices or shops and that they are now being converted into residential. Um, it's known as permitted development um, and it re-energises uh, city centres um, and repurposes buildings that would otherwise be demolished, um, which um, is um, um, sometimes it's a shame. Sometimes you might have a building that might be listed, so it's it can't be can't be demolished. Um, so it repurposes it and, and re-energises the, um, the building. Um, we're working with Network Homes and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing with Network Homes uh, at our Burnt Oak Broadway site shortly. Um, we're also working with Southern Housing Group, um, the Brunel University and, uh, and, and Thomas's Schools. So it's a very varied um, 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 type of construction that, that we do. Um, we've got a bit of a mini quiz and I'll hand over to Sam to give you a bit of an overview of the construction industry. Um, so uh, over to you, Sam. OK, so we've got three questions for you. Um, obviously, there's going to be a right answer for each one, but don't worry if you don't get it right. This is purely for knowledge purposes and to just kind of stretch our minds to see what the wider construction sector actually looks like across the UK. So question number one. What do you think is the annual turnover, financially wise, of the UK construction industry? So we have A, £117 billion pound per year, B, £250 billion pound per year, or C, £50 billion pound per year. OK, and the answer is A. 117 billion pound per year so it's a huge sector that actually turns over and brings a lot of money into the um, UK economy. Question two. How many UK based companies are linked to the construction sector? So we have A 100,000, B 200,000 or C 300,000. The answer 
is C, 300,000. That's a huge amount of companies that are actually linked into our sector one way or another. And Michael's going to go into some more detail around what that can look like in a short while. And the final question. How many people in the UK are employed in the construction sector? A, 1 million, B, 3 million, or C, 4 million? The answer is B, 3 million. So that's 3 million of our circa 70 million people that live in the UK that are actually working and employed in our sector. How many of those did you get right? <laughs> Thank you, Sam. So within the construction industry, as, as you'll see there, there's there's a lot of opportunity um, and the roles within construction vary greatly. And we'll come on to some of that um, a little bit later. But specifically with Network Homes and uh, working within the London Borough of Barnet, um, what I, the project I'm involved in is, um, is known as Burnt Oak Broadway, where we're building 100 apartments, uh, and those 100 apartments are above office space and an underground car park. Um, the construction is um, um, uh, three three blocks, um, and those three blocks are formed using a concrete and reinforced steel structure. Um, the um, this is quite um, a common or the the most common form of construction, um, uh, particularly for residential um, apartments within in within London and and the UK. Although there are more varied methods um, that are being developed, and and uh, there's what's uh, known as uh, modern methods of construction. So it could be volumetric, or it could be system builds. Um, but uh, it is still uh, the the leading method of construction in the UK today. Um, within the uh, within those hundred uh, apartments, there's a mix of of tenures. So a, a majority of the units are, are shared ownership, whereby um, the properties are uh, are part. You can buy part of the property. Um, and the other part is retained by by network homes, and it's really helps people get onto the onto the housing ladder. Um, but then equally, there are a number of um, affordable rent homes, um, which uh, is part of a, a, a planning consent, but um, is uh, is also gives a, a, a good demographic for for a mix of people that occupy the the uh, the blocks. Um, the building is going to be 13 storeys high, and it's going to be really prominent in the skyline around Burn, uh, Burnt Oak and Barnet. We're only up to about the seventh floor at the moment, but when you go up the top there, the, the views that you'll get from the apartments from sort of sixth, seventh, eighth floor upwards, they're going to be absolutely fantastic. You can see the London skyline, the Shard, um, Wembley Stadium, um, BT Tower. So it's it's uh, so anyone living in this block really going to really going to have an absolutely fantastic view of, um, of of London. The project itself is um, is over 21 million pounds to build, um, so it's not an insignificant amount of money to be invested by network homes um, in in uh, the uh, in the borough. And now, whilst we're during construction, there'll be up to 80 people actively working on the site at any one time. Uh, and that doesn't include the head office support staff um, and our supply chain. Um, as you can imagine, when we're actually building a building, there's going to be all the deliveries that come to site, the materials, um, um, as well as the people in our head office, people like Sam, there'll be our surveyors, there'll be designers. Uh, as, as well as the main designers for the building, there'd be architects, engineers, and as well as the people uh, from Network Homes themselves. As we spoke about earlier on, within the industry, um, you know, it's it's a major um, uh, part of the UK economy, um, and employing 3.1 million people, nearly 10% of the UK workforce. 
This is just directly employed within the construction industry. There are so many other support industries that all feed into construction. Even when you think about it, just getting to work, you, you know, you're, you're, you're either driving a car, you're jumping on the rail, um, and all of those help the economy and help the wheels turn within the UK. Within the construction industry, um, there's a huge skills gap. Um, though, and that means there's lots of opportunities for jobs and apprenticeships within the construction industry uh, as, as we need to upskill um, uh, the young people in, in, the, in the country. Um, and these, these opportunities, they vary. Um, for ARJ, we're a main contractor. Uh, and for a main contractor, as we've described here, are like event planners. So we'll bring in a lot of specialists together, architects, structural engineers, ground workers, concrete frame contractors, bricklayers and kitchen installers and many others. So essentially what happens is you'll have all of these other people, we'll pull them all in together and we'll get the designers to design and say how the building should be built. They make sure that it complies with the regulations and then those designs are then shared with the builders who will then we will then coordinate to make sure that they all come in at the right time um, and that they deliver the work to the right standard. And the main contractor, um, as I say, it, it's not just about planning the building, it's how we get the materials to site, the construction methods that we use. So as a main contractor, it's a very complex and difficult project to try and coordinate everyone. Some people might say it's like trying to herd kittens, um, a very difficult job um, most of the time. Um, a lot of the trades, um, if you're if you're um, uh, an academic, um, you're probably likely to be more leaning towards architecture or engineering or management or quantity surveying. And if you're more of a hands on person, more of a doer, um, opportunities that may be more suited to you may be the apprenticeship routes such as um, plumbers, electricians, plasterers and what have you. And there's plenty of opportunities for all of those within the construction industry. And even if you um, think to yourself, I might like to be in a managerial role one, managerial role one day, but I'm just not sure it's right for me now. People that start off in uh, vocational skills such as bricklaying and, and carpentry and uh, plumbing and electrical, it doesn't preclude you from that. In the future, um, you can work your way through to being a manager of your chosen skill, whether that be electrical, plumbing or what have you, and you can fulfill your managerial role within the specialist fields. So nothing, there's no, there's no barriers within construction stopping you. So it's really a case of, um, you know, getting in and experiencing it. And with what I say to, to youngsters is that, you know, be interested, get involved, and while you're young, give it a go. If, it, if you after a year or two, you think, you know what, this isn't for me, or, or you want to diversify and you don't really want to be in a vocational skill, you want to be in managerial, you've got the opportunity to change. Just because you start off on an apprenticeship or, or, or one route of education, you're not pigeonholed into that for the rest of your life. You've got the opportunity, give it a try, um, and uh, develop your careers. Um, I'll now hand over to, <clears throat> to Sam, who can um, talk through a little bit more about the opportunities and pathways into construction. Thank you, Michael. So I, I think our sector, there are there's such a wide variety of opportunities to to move into construction and to work within in construction and, and some of them aren't quite as obvious as brick laying, carpentry, roofing, plasters, etc. Um, so I want to just kind of open that up with you all really so that um, we can sort of um, yeah delve into to the opportunities available. So there's two routes really and they are termed as either white collar or blue collar. So white collar roles tend to be more academic. So these will be opportunities that need several years of studying for and qualification. So they may be architects, construction management, engineers, quantity surveyors and more. On the more vocational side, as in blue collar, and as Michael has said, for those that prefer to be 
more on the job or want to actually get practical experience a, and have a practical role within construction. You have the likes of plumbing, plastering, carpentry, brick lane, etc. Um, electrical um, electricians um, as the blue collar route into construction. Within our business and within our other main contractors, they the roles will include roles such as site managers, pro project managers. These are typically site based. We have technical roles such as technical design managers. These tend to be split between office and site and are involved very much in the actual overall design and the ongoing design as the, as the projects um, progressing. Roles that involve money or more sort of finance for those that are very um, mathematically minded include quantity surveying, finance roles which are in, in the back office. There are also roles that are um, the likes of marketing, which will, you know, every business needs to let the world know who they are and what they do. We have bid writers within our business and we've um, recently taken on a trainee within our role that that role and they're coming from a degree background in writing we have hr so i work in hr there's it and there's also roles such as buying technical administration um, we have a, a, a big team of project coordinators that all of our sites need very much to coordinate all of the um just the day-to-day -day paperwork and the administration the drawings etc um trade opportunities as we said blue collar as i touched on before we have electricians plumbers bricklayers roofers scaffolders carpenters and many many more 71 percent of apprentices do come via SMEs and what an SME is is um, a small to medium enterprise and we are an SME business with 140 um, employees within our business um, and that can either be via the trade route or the subcontractor route so we rely very heavily on our subcontractors and our trade support to actually build the projects that we work on. Within the construction sector, a lot of involvement um, of what we do and a, lot, and a lot of the reason you know, behind what we do is to add social value. So social value is really important because that allows us to work with the local communities. So we are very much involved in supporting charities, local schools, colleges, businesses in the community and also those that live in the community to um, hopefully make things better for them and to offer support things like today, offering advice of how to obtain a career within our sector, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we hire apprentices, so we do have several apprentices within our business, as will all construction companies or the majority of construction companies and trade and, and um, subcontractor support. And we use apprenticeship training agencies like Joe Brennan Training to find our apprentices and then also to support our apprentices through their uh, qualification routes. The minimum level entry, if you are looking to consider an apprenticeship, is level four in English and maths. If you don't have level four English and maths after leaving school, this is something that can be um, actually studied side by side along with your apprenticeship route. So please don't think that, you know, you can't obtain an apprenticeship if you do, don't receive the level four, because as I said, you can study that at the same time and pick that up as you go down either the vocational or the more white collar route. Qualification and apprenticeship routes can take many years, actually, and it does depend very much on whether you are going to be studying full time versus part time. So part time might see you in an apprenticeship where you are 20 percent of the time, i.e. one day out of five actually studying. It might be on day release. It might be at a college or, or a university where you're actually obtaining the theory behind the practical that you're obtaining for four days of the week. If you was looking to go down the architect route, for instance, it would take you seven years of full time study to become fully qualified. So that is a lot of input and a, and a lot of effort that needs to be put in by individuals looking to go down this route. If you were looking to go down the route of a carpenter and you were studying full time, it would take you two years to actually qualify. And then obviously a lot of on the job training um and the experience that you know experienced carpenters gain is as the years go by working on different jobs with different um, complications etc so you do have the option to be on the job and also studying or to be studying full time and that's very much dependent on the individual circumstance but training providers can actually um, help you to decide which is the best route for you 
Success stories. So ARJ, about six years ago, we were in a position to start bringing through trainees into our business. So we started within our commercial team and we actually hired our first two trainees. So that was um, Mason and Liam. They joined us as trainee surveyors and they have been studying higher, via a higher, higher apprenticeship scheme and whilst they've been employed and working in various departments of our business to gain a real overview of what the construction sector is and what we do as a company, they have, um, we are very proud to say, both achieved first class honours in their degrees. And we have just found out this week that so has Sam. He was a trainee that joined us a year later. Um, so we're very proud of the fact that our first three trainees into the business within our commercial department have all obtained on the job, first class honours degrees, and now some of them, um, well, all of them are managing some of their own projects. So we have seven trainee surveyors working for us in the company at the moment within our commercial department, and they are major majority in the main based from head office or home post COVID, um, a bit of a mix of the both. Um, but we also have two site management trainees working within our business. So they are day to day based on site with a day study release um, and they are going down the route of more of a construction management degree type qualification. Um, Brenda, one of our um, recent site management trainees, she was actually one of our first. Um, she basically walked onto a site, so she saw our signage, um, wanted to obtain an opportunity. She walked onto site, asked to speak to one of our contract managers and was so impressive um, that we couldn't not employ her and support her through her qualification route. And she's doing brilliant. She's working down on our Crimscott Street site. We also have five trade apprentices, um, or we will have, we have the opportunities for them at our Burnt Oak um, project um, that Michael's obviously heading up. And they will be available via Joe Brennan Training, plus other training providers um, and available to view on their sites. But we will put our contact details up at the end of this presentation. So if you have any queries on that, you can, you can contact us directly and we can point you in the right direction. But if you are looking for more of an on the job, hands on, trade type opportunity, we will have five. So we wanted to offer some um, some advice really um, around what to do uh, when you are applying for jobs and how to prepare for interviews, because obtaining these opportunities, is, is it's not an easy route all the time and interviewing and preparing for interviews and actually just applying for jobs is quite the skill that we're not naturally necessarily born with. Um, and it's a very, very competitive market. So how do we make ourselves stand out? How do we make an employer view our CV and want to actually interview us? And then once they've seen us, want to offer us a position and an opportunity to obtain a career with them. The first thing is attitude. Attitude is everything. Um, we like to say be more Brenda. We love the fact that Brenda took it upon herself. She decided one day she loved the look of um, what we were doing. She had done some research on us, wanted to work for us and headed to Sai, asked for the right person. And um, that proactive stance has seen her now within our business um, doing really well. Showing enthusiasm and commitment. So if you decide to apply for a position, you need to make sure that you are looking out for response. So an employer may respond to you direct or a training provider may respond to you direct and you want to look committed, you want to look interested. So I would 100% um, recommend that you respond in a timely fashion. So um, and showing enthusiasm, asking questions, etc., the big smiles, being interested, all of that is really, really important. Adopting good time management. So when we're talking about interviews, whether it's an online interview or an actual face to face interview, arrive in a few minutes beforehand. One that can help with nerves, but two that shows again going back to enthusiasm and also that you, you do keep good time management. And responding to emails and any correspondence, if someone's left you a voicemail, calling them back in a professional manner in a timely manner is really important too to show that you're interested. And importantly, as I've already touched on, the employment market is very competitive. There's literally hundreds of thousands of people out there looking to obtain opportunities. Although there is a skills shortage within our sector and, and within many sectors in the UK, 
Um, if someone's looking for a breakthrough opportunity and they haven't got experience at the moment, there is a lot of people that are within that sort of demographic. How do you make yourself stand out? All of the above can definitely help you with that. Your CV. Your CV really is the kind of snippet. So when someone applies for a position, there's no real human behind that until the interview process. So your CV is where you allow an employer to find out more about you and to find out about your personality and what you're wanting so that they can make a decision whether they feel you'd be right for their business culture and whether um, the business culture would be right for you as well. Firstly, number one, keep your CV up to date. I've worked in recruitment for nearly 20 years. I've probably viewed, I would hate to even hazard a guess, at least 50,000 CVs I would imagine during that time. And the amount of times that I see a CV that hasn't been kept up to date or the dates are wrong, there's spelling and grammatical errors. Um, every computer has a, a spell check. Um, so it's kind of a little bit unforgivable if there are errors. A little tip on that is to read your CV backwards. Sometimes when you get used to seeing something, you don't see um, errors, but to just kind of skim read from the last page backwards um, might point out something a little bit glaring. But yeah, definitely make sure it's up to date and that the dates and things are right. Using the spell check and grammar check, checking the dates of education, checking your work experience, making sure that is really it is correct, is really important. You wouldn't want to enable an employer to think that you've got a two year gap in your employment history when actually you haven't, for instance. Preparing a covering email, really, really important because you haven't got the chance. When I first started in recruitment, we used to hand deliver CVs or post them um, and we would hand write letters and things. Um, but now we, we send emails and the email is your opportunity to explain why you want the opportunity to talk about what you're looking for from your um, interim and long term career and to also mention why you want to work in the construction sector specifically, especially if you haven't gained experience to date, because remember your email is landing at the same time as maybe 10, 20, 30, who knows other people's you need to stand out. So ensuring that it's actually personalised is, is also really important, taking the time to find out the name of the HR manager or the recruiting manager or the contract manager and actually using that as in, dear Michael, I'm writing to you today and including my CV because etc. You should include an about me section. You know, we are all individual. We all have our own, you know, personalities. And I think it is quite nice when you read a CV to get a bit of a feel for someone's personality. But the key thing is to avoid cliches. I see so many CVs that are, you know, I'm a good timekeeper. I'm a leader. I'm this, I'm that. But they don't have anything that actually backs that up. So if you are going to state that, for instance, you are a strong leader, you need to say why. It may be that you lead your local scouting group, for instance, and you've done that for several years and you've really enjoyed doing that. It might be that you're very organised. How can you demonstrate that you're organised? It may well be that in your most recent role or within your most recent education that you had to submit several, you know, um, work on several projects at one time. How did you organise yourself? So we want to know the whys, not just the whats, but the whys are very, very important um, and definitely include examples of those. You want to make sure that your CV is presentable, especially for more creative roles such as technical managers, bid writers, etc. Um, but certainly with regards to any CV, ensure that your font and the font size is the same throughout. Always start with your name and contact details. Then lead on, I would recommend that you lead on to the about me section, followed by education and then followed by any work experience that you have. And don't be scared to show if you've worked in several places. You might want to go back to your about me section to talk about why you moved, you know, you moved roles, for instance, so that when someone's reading your CV, they can see it. But ensuring the CV is presentable in um, is, is, is absolutely essential. And if you need help on that, Google. Google's brilliant. There's so many templates available online um, that you could that you could use. Asking someone else to review your CV is a really good tip because the second pair of eyes is always good. We can create something. It looks good to us, but someone else reading it might see something that they're like, that doesn't make sense. Or why have you not put that first? Or actually, I don't like the font. It's not very legible. If I was to open it on a mobile device, we have to think now we're all on smartphones. 
and even recruiters. Sometimes I open CVs on my smartphone, my work smartphone, and it doesn't come up the same as it would do on a laptop. So you need to ensure that, you know, that it is smartphone enabled, etc. Um, but a second eye, a pair of eyes is good. That could be your tutor. That could be a friend, a family member, um, a colleague, anyone really. So you've done all of that. Your CV is up to date. You've sent it over. The recruiting manager has reviewed it and they've in included you in their interview process, which is fantastic because that's the next step in the process to obtain an interview. Without an interview, you can't get a job on offer. My biggest tip on interviewing is research. So I can't stress enough to research, research, research. When I've interviewed people over the years and I've asked them what they know about the company that I've been recruiting for, and they or they may have no questions. I kind of feel it's a bit unforgivable. Obviously, we all suffer with nerves and we can all get a bit of straight stage fright and that's completely normal. Um, but to not know anything, to not have looked into anything is, is really unforgivable. And you can just Google a company name now. I mean, if you Google us, our website comes up, projects that we're working on, subcontractors that we work with will have documents online about us. You can find out about our leadership team online, our most recent projects. There'll be articles in local press, no doubt, about what we've done. There's so much that you, you can actually find out by researching. Presentability, and that's about you. Ensuring that you are presentable for an interview is really important. Pre-COVID, we would have always met face to face. It would have been in an office based environment or possibly on site. But ensuring that your appearance, that your, you know, your hair is and hair and clothing is clean and tidy, smart, smart, casual is OK for some interviews. Some interviews will still be very formal where they want someone to arrive in a suit or a smart dress or, you know, um, chinos and, and, and a shirt. You can always ask the recruiter that you're working with or the, the line manager or the person that's going to interview you how you should dress. And that is not a bad question to ask. I never feel that, you know, if someone asks me that, I never make a judgment on that because I'd rather someone ask and get it right and then feel comfortable rather than arriving in, say, jeans and a T-shirt that's got you know, dust all over it and then not making that first impression that, you know, you want that you want to make smiling. Body language is 80 percent of communication. So though we talk, um, what we don't say is is also very, very important. So smiling, it shows that you are um, friendly for a start. It also shows that you are engaged. Eye contact's extremely important. Um, you don't have to stare at someone the whole time. It is OK to look away, but holding eye contact when someone's asking you a question or you're actually giving them, offering them an answer um, allows for that connection. And I always believe that interviews are about collection, uh, connection. Be on time. It's that this is unforgivable to be late for an interview, whether it's online or whether it's in person is fairly unforgivable if you haven't called in advance. So if you do get stuck in traffic or something happens and you're going to be late, you need to call in advance. Do not call after that interview time um, because obviously you should have been prepared, sat ready at your laptop or computer or equally in the reception area of the building that you're um, uh, or site office that you're actually going to interview at. Shaking hands. We haven't shook hands for a long time during COVID, but I think in the main, a lot of people are back to shaking hands now. Um, if someone offers you their hand to shake, then I would shake their hand if the interviewer actually outreaches their hand to you. A nice, firm, confident handshake will always allow a, a recruiter or, or a line manager, um, a decision maker to feel that connection. And again, just going back to that, that connection is all important. Be confident. They chose to interview you. They've seen your CV. They know about you already. You've given them a window into what you do so you can have a certain level of confidence for the interviews and interviews are a two way street. So it's not just about you being interviewed, but you can view it that you're interviewing them as well. You want to know, are they good for me? Do I want to work for this company? What can they offer me? So if you look at it as a two way street, I always find that that does help with the nerves a little. And really importantly, remember to take note of the interviewer's name. So the person you're meeting with, they would no doubt have sent you an email to confirm who you're meeting with. Importantly, remember their name, call them by their name. So if Michael was interviewing me, I would say, Michael, that's thank you very much for that information. Um, he would ask me a question. I may say um, and just going back to that, Michael. So refer to them by name. Again, it's about connection. Familiarise yourself with your own CV. 
again, an unforgivable point. You wrote this CV. You put this CV together. This CV is based on truth, on your background and experience. I have interviewed several people over the years that haven't known their own dates or they haven't realised something on their CV and they've said, really? Oh, I didn't realise that was on there. You should realise that's on there. So do familiarise yourself with your CV. And as you update it, I would definitely recommend, again, if it's based on truth, you don't need to memorise it because you will know the information. But um, yeah, being familiar is important. And being familiar with the job description, every company will have some level of job description behind a vacancy. It might not be as detailed as another company, but it may be a few bullet points. But it's really important to ask for that job description if it hasn't been sent to you. Um, have a look through it write notes on it think right okay i've done this but i haven't done that what even is this be ready to explain your skills so that it shows that you match with what the company is looking for but also it might offer you a couple of questions or points to say you know i haven't actually done this but i do understand what it is and it's something that i would like to do in the future reviewing typical interview questions so you can again google these there's so much help out there online for interview skills lots of videos on youtube etc that you can watch if you've not really got a lot a lot of interviewing experience be ready to talk about your past experiences both work and life based this will demonstrate that you, the skills you've stated on your application are not only true but that you other things come out from discussion so you might be talking about something that's non-work related that is around um, communication and because you're discussing it the interviewer can see that you have really strong communication skills and within that particular role that's what's needed interview questions at the end of every interview i will guarantee that you will be asked have you got any questions some of the things that you might have wanted to ask may have been covered during the interview and i would probably recommend that you don't ask a question around something that the interviewer has spent time explaining to you already because that unfortunately could maybe allow them to think that you wasn't listening however i think by preparing two to three questions in advance around what you might want to ask during or at the end of an interview there will be at least one that hasn't been covered and during a first interview stage, I would always steer clear away, a steer away from how many holidays do I get and what is the salary that you'd be paying me? That those sort of questions are for a later stage in the interview process if it hasn't already been covered off on phone calls before. You want to be asking questions around career progression, development, qualification routes, how much support will you be get, will you receive? How many other trainees are within the business? How have they been doing? You know, the last person you recruited into this role, how are they now doing those sort of questions to show that you're interested, but that will also give you some information to um, enable you to decide if you're offered whether you'd want to work for that company. With regards to uh, further interview tips, specifically if they're online via Zoom or Teams or FaceTime, WhatsApp, really, really important. Number one is that your volume is on and that your camera's turned on. No one wants to interview a black screen where the person isn't actually visible, but you can hear a voice because we need to make that connection. So you might want to test your volume and camera with a friend or with a family member before your actual interview time to check that it's working. Consider your location. So, you know, the world has moved a lot towards working from home more. We now interview in cafes, in bars, in restaurants, on the bus, in the car while you're pulled over. Sometimes this these are great for an internal meeting location wise, but sometimes they're not the best location for an interview. You want your background to be very calm. You want to think about background noise. You don't want someone seeing the background with your pile of washing behind you, for instance, or that someone else might be sat behind you in a cafe or a restaurant and they can actually see the interviewer. That can be quite off putting. So really think about that and prepare for where you're going to be. If you not know that you won't be home at 4 p.m., but you'll be home at half past five, ask for the interview to be at half five. If that can't be accommodated, ask for a different day because this is all about you and you making that first impression. If the interviewer can't hear you, can't see you or is distracted by things going on in the black background or noise in the background, um, this could go against you, which is a real shame because it's quite hard to get to the interview stage. So you don't want to waste that opportunity. And my final point on this is to still be presented smartly, even if the interview is online. No ones is no vests with just um, um, strings there. Um, no um, 
hoodies, covering your face, covering your head. You want to be smartly, smartly presented. If it's an office based role, wear a shirt or a blouse. If it's a site based role, a polo shirt, for instance, would be absolutely um, fine from a presentation point of view. Try to keep logos to a minimum. Um, you want them to focus on you and not the logo blazoned across your chest, for instance. Um, but most importantly, make the most of your opportunity because there is a job out there waiting for you. Michael, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Something else to uh, bear in mind that if you're in an interview process, um, <laughs> if you mute, mute, <laughs> mute your um, uh, microphone do remember to turn it back on um, as I say thank you very much um, for your time and hopefully you found today's presentation informative and helpful and um, and um, I do hope that you do consider a career in construction it's a very enjoyable uh, field to work in uh, I've worked in it for a long time I won't tell you how many years but it's a long time um, and it's and it's been a good career for me. Um, and if you have any questions, I uh, appreciate um, that you can you could contact either myself or Sam Carroll via the email address that will be at the base of this uh, presentation, which will be uh, online, or you can visit our website www.arj.co.uk. Um, and uh, uh, thank you, Sam, for uh, co-hosting the event with me. And thank you very much to Kamara for facilitating the meeting with Network Homes. Thank you very much, everybody.